I never shut my eyes. I could see the shark again. The only thing is, when I relived it, I didn't get away. It, it ate me. A single frame in my head that I can never forget. It's just always there. I had my arm up the uterus of a lemon shark, then I realized I'd been bit by an unborn shark. Shark, primal predator. One of our deepest fears made flesh. But what really happens when sharks attack? British tourists traveling abroad face all kinds of new and exotic dangers. One of them is shark attack. Chris Sullivan was looking forward to the perfect surfing holiday on South Africa's Cape Coast with girlfriend Barbara. He'd no idea of the ordeal ahead, but he did know what lay beneath. I've surfed here, West Australia, Indonesia, places where there are sharks, and every time I go somewhere like that, I'm always, before I have my first surf, I'm always a little bit trepidatious about, about sharks. Fatal shark attacks are rare. Statistics over the last decade reveal shifting hotspots. South Africa, the US, Brazil, and Australia. Their bloody nature makes them big news. I've seen one shark film, uh, I think, in Kuzul and Natal, where somebody was actually filming the guys surfing, and as this guy paddled for a wave, I see the shark in the back of the wave. And he was lucky he just started paddling and it grabbed hold of his hand. I got four or five good waves over the space of about 45 minutes. The one guy, Sean, he actually joked when he, when he paddled out to us. He said, oh, beautiful day, nice warm water. And, uh, you know, having a, having a bit of a surf with a few mates and a few sharks, that, that was his joke. Many of the world's favorite surf breaks are uncomfortably close to shark feeding grounds. There's a truly impressive sight within a stone's throw of Cape Town, though most visitors never see it. Great white sharks feed enthusiastically on Cape fur seals. For surfers, it's out of sight and mostly out of mind, until one of them becomes an unwitting target. I was chatting to my friend Keith, and as I turned, Literally two or three metres away, I saw, I saw the shark. Keith says they saw the fin come out of the water and then they saw it rear up behind me. My first initial reaction was just shock and well, this can't be right. And so at that point, I tried to take evasive action and uh, that's when I um, kicked it in, in the face. I remember my, my foot being inside its mouth. I sort of lashed out with my fist like that and then I remember really vividly um, the, the teeth couldn't through my leg, and it felt almost like somebody else's leg, but I can just feel this, the slicing. Fortunately for Chris, his fellow surfers were able to control his bleeding at the beach and quickly got him to hospital. The shark's teeth had cut his leg to the bone, but like the surgeon's knife, had made clean incisions. Chris needed 200 stitches antibiotics and careful nursing. Got a deep groove in the bone. You could actually see where the tooth had grooved the bone. Really? Yeah, I'm surprised there wasn't a, you know, I didn't find any broken teeth in that wound. Being a carer is, is not a very nice thing to do. It's quite a stressful thing to do because, you know, the person that you love is in pain and you're, it's down to you to try to make them actually better. Right, this is the really nasty bit. Two, three, go. <coughs> to begin with, it was my thoughts a lot, you know. I mean, the first night, whenever I shut my eyes, it may have been the morphine, but whenever I shut my eyes, I could see the shark again, and I was, I was reliving the incident again. When I relived it, it I didn't get away. It, it ate me. I was worried. I was worried that I was going to have this all the time. The body just kicks in in a huge protective way. And it's, it's like it swamps the, the feeling part of it. Then that feeling comes in a bit. Then our beliefs and our knowledge come in and they whip that feeling up. And it goes on like this for a long time, I think. And some people do manage by themselves. Other people need some help to get over their experiences. 17-year-old J.P. Andrew had an even worse experience in 2004 at a beach near Cape Town. The one question I asked the police was, how bad is it? And he said to me, very bad. It was worse than very bad. 
JP appeared to be dead. But the ambulance crew had not given up on him. Neither had his mother. They were driving away um, on their way to the hospital and one of them saw a little beep on the monitor. And they weren't sure if it was a heartbeat or if it was just the shaking of the ambulance. And he shouted at the driver to stop, just to make sure. And as they stopped, they, they watched the monitor and they said there was a heartbeat. I died for 30 minutes on the beach and then five minutes in the hospital. So I did actually go over the edge and then I was like clinging on. Young, resilient and supported by his family, JP continues to surf despite repeated surgery. I knew that I was going to get back in the water. There's uh, all my friends surf or bodyboard or whatever. And you know, it's just, if it's a part of your life, you can't just kick it out. Sharks are cool. Sharks are animals, you know, if like, if I was in the bush vault and I was, and I walk right through a lion's den and I got attacked, would anybody blame them, you know? The whole sea is their den, you know? South Africa, definitely a hot spot. Attacks by great white sharks dominate the statistics and deaths are higher than the world average. So why do attacks like these happen and what can we learn from them? Research biologist Mark Marks has spent his working life studying sharks, first in his native California and then in South Africa. Why do sharks bite people? Clearly, the question really should be flipped over. And it's not why do sharks bite people, but why don't they bite them over often? These are not mindless predators that are just operating on, on hardwired behavior. Sharks learn, they store information, they have memories, and they are very quick to adapt to a changing situation. They're very mobile in their behavior. Like any scientist studying animal behavior, Mark needs to get close to his subjects, and he's certainly done that. He approaches the animals underwater, outside the cage, free swimming with them, interacting, observing, and videoing them. Mark has gained a unique perspective on shark attacks. Not only is he qualified to explain the shark's behavior, but he can also see it from the other side as a vulnerable human being. Over the years, I've had sharks knock me around a little bit, and um, I've had two concussions. I had the top of my thumb bitten on, had to sew it. My left hand was, was fractured by a tail slap. The small toe of my left foot bitten by a great hammerhead, been smacked with tail swipes to the head twice, one of which I had to stitch up in the field. My arm up the uterus of a lemon shark in Belize, and I was helping deliver babies. I felt this bite, and it's gushing blood. Then I realized I'd been bit by an unborn shark, and two of my vertebrae fractured by a white shark twisting me around. Mark investigates an attack that happened off Campbell Island, south of New Zealand, at the limit of the white shark's range. A lover of wildlife, Mike Fraser volunteered for a weather service posting on the subantarctic island in 1992. One day in April, Mike was snorkeling in the cold waters, hoping to get close to the southern right whale. Been in the water about 30 minutes, and I was just floating on the surface, and just a, a big hit from the right-hand side hit me. Mike Fraser of Wellington was in a stable condition when he arrived at Invercargill Airport this afternoon after a four-hour helicopter flight from Campbell Island. Mr Fraser is officer in charge of the island's weather station. He lost an arm in a shark attack while swimming yesterday. He hit me by the right arm, and I'm not quite sure when it happened, but I realised that my left arm was absolutely useless because he lacerated that. And that's when I brought my knees and feet up into his face and tried to push him away. Um, and I think that's when my arm came off. Mike probably survived because the frigid water helped stop his bleeding. But he had to endure an entire night on the beach 
waiting for a rescue helicopter to fly 700 kilometers from the mainland. And you never saw the shark coming, but never, the, the never impact saw. comes from, from the right. Yeah. After the initial hit, I got taken underwater. Um, I didn't know what it was. And when I got back to the surface, I looked across to the right-hand side, and it was a big shark head with my arm down its mouth. What orientation is the shark to you? Where is, say, where is its snout pointed? The, the snout's pointing over my right-hand shoulder with my arm down its mouth and its eye about there. And it's just a, like a single frame in my head that I can never forget. It's just always there. What we've got is you being struck from the right, impact, there's some movement that had to happen underwater. Either you turned or the shark did. OK, well, I've got a couple of cut marks across there, and it got bitten off just below the elbow there. These injuries down here, these are from the lower teeth of the shark's jaw. The shark comes across your body, cutting across horizontal at the surface. Now it has both of your arms in its mouth, and you're taken down. Your hand pops out of its mouth. You've got this turn, and that's where you look up and you see the right side of the shark's head. That's where you lose your arm. Because that's kind of the position, do you agree? Oh, definitely, yeah, it was over the, over the right hand like that. And that, that certainly explains it. I can never figure out why or how the damage on this left hand, because it just went in and out so quick, I just can't recall it even being in there. Forensics tell the story. Mark's work can help victims of shark attacks understand what happened to them, an important step on the road to recovery. Mike Fraser felt compelled to return to Campbell Island to learn more about the area's white sharks. He found evidence of attacks on sea lions, but Mark thinks sleeper sharks may be responsible for these wounds. Mike also discovered historic accounts of white sharks feeding on whale carcasses. White sharks will eat fish, seals, and even seabirds, but whale blubber is a high-octane prize they'll gorge on. Humans rarely become prey, but when they do, the results are shocking. It was savage, it was quick, and it came from nowhere. A massive white pointer on a grey, misty Cottesloe morning. It charged first at 48-year-old Ken Crew, taking his whole leg in just one bite. It then turned on lawyer Dirk Avery, who frantically scrambled onto a reef and tried to kick it away. Five years later, at the beach where a white shark injured him and killed his friend, Ken Crew, Dirk Avery still swims regularly. Dirk and Ken were members of the Sea Slugs, a group of social swimmers who have swum at the beach without incident for years. Shark biologist Mark Marks analyzes the attack with Dirk Avery. Could you just kind of relate back to me, um, kind of a summary of what, what happened? A group of about eight of us that morning, which normally swam, and um, six of them went ahead, and Ken and I were just having a bit of a chat on the beach because we had a sort of a love of the same sort of music that and talking about, etc. We allowed the other six to go ahead, and I can recall Ken saying to me, look, I think there's something out there. Uh, I said, look, it's probably only a seal, Ken, because the, you get a lot of seals migrating up and down the coastline here. So after that, I suppose you might call reassurance, we both got in the water and swam out. Ken went straight ahead, which he normally did. The next thing I recall is just seeing this big mountain of water and what appeared to be Ken's body coming out, out of the water and then the water was just that brownish type of red. And as soon as I saw that, I knew it was a shark attack. And the next thing I recall was the, the shark was coming at me and this big dorsal fin approaching. And I would have probably been in waist-deep water, just off the reef. Mm -hmm. And the next thing I recall was that the shark was attacking me and had my right foot in its mouth. For Dirk, one question still looms large. What I was um, a little bit 
you know, mystified about is why the shark would have singled out probably Ken and myself mm -hmm. when there were so many other people in the swimming area. Often white sharks uh, will single out prey items or objects they're interested because it, it, it's easier as a focal point to pick out an individual that's separated than to move into a group where it's quite busy. I've watched white sharks take seals, for example, literally in a raft of say 50, 60 seals. They kind of move around the outside and eventually end up selecting the, the animal that's cut away from the group. That would sort of fit in with the scenario on that tragic day that Ken was on the outer and on, on one side and I was on the outer on the other side, so. Very likely. The surface of the sea is not a place I want to be. You have to break the water. Now, a relaxed swimmer might do an even breast stroke, but that's not what most people do. They freestyle. And that freestyle when splashing, that kind of sound, that kind of vibration is interesting to a white shark. Personally, I, I, I would prefer my swimming to be in a pool rather than the sea. The rapid development of tropical Queensland's Gold Coast is a mecca for new residents and estate agents because of its highly marketable leisure lifestyle. It's the last place you might expect a shark attack. Two kayakers found 84-year-old Bob Purcell's body outside the waterfront home where he lived. Part of his leg had been bitten off. The victim swam in the lake several times a week, ignoring pleas from neighbours. Three days, four days ago, he was going out there. I said, you shouldn't be doing that. I said, there's sharks there. Mark visits the spot where Bob Purcell met his death on February the 8th, 2003. How can shark attacks happen in these tranquil surroundings? Two people died here within a few weeks and just a few hundred meters of each other. The species best suited to take advantage of these developments is the bull shark. Bull sharks have an incredible physiological tolerance for low salinity water. What that means is that it enables them to move between salt and fresh water. They've even been known to go hundreds of miles from the sea. The problem for suburban swimmers is this artificial system of waterways, which connects with the open sea. Small bull sharks enter through these tidal sluice gates. If food is plentiful, they can grow big, maybe even too big to leave the system. The canals are an ideal habitat, rich in prey, so many sizable bull sharks live here, seldom seen. Neil Martin tells what happened when his 23-year-old son, Bo, went for a late night swim with a friend. They thought they'll go for a swim and, and then call it a night. Dave said he heard him yell. Dave then swam over towards the, the noise and when he got over there, there was no one there. And that's the last we seen of Bo. So early on the third morning, I got my kayak. I paddled down into the where the debris Loaded, and that's where he was. I found him there. I realised that his lower part of his leg was missing, and that's when it dawned on me he'd he'd been taken by a shark. Something like this, it just brings me bent down to my knees. I I'm so humble and, and I'm I'm devastated. After the deaths, the local shark contractor was brought in to catch some of the canal-dwelling sharks, just like the movie, Jaws. The authorities were seen to be doing something, however ineffectual. Queensland's ocean beaches are already protected by shark nets. The news media went into a feeding frenzy. Three bull sharks were caught. Not one 
with human flesh in its stomach. I don't blame the sharks. The sharks live in there. They don't, you know, they're just animals. They, um, they need to eat, and uh, as we do. Um, but as I say, if they live in there, we shouldn't swim in there. In the cases of Bo Martin and Bob Purcell, both were swimming in poor light conditions. In clear water, bull shark attacks are less likely, but they still happen. Dr. Eric Ritter has spent many years in the Bahamas studying the animal's behavior and introducing others to them. The animals are hand-fed to bring them in close, while the students are taught not to show any signs of panic. TV crews are attracted too, as man and beast draw ever closer. The animal came very, very slow. She was a cautious, hesitant. Problem was, we were in shallow water and she got stuck. So she literally freaked out. She got stressed out. Her escape routes were limited to nothing. So she had to do something. And the only thing she could do was moving me away together with her to get into on the safer ground. I've never felt such a pain. This exploratory bite got way out of hand. The animal got stressed. And because she got stressed, she tried to bite through my leg and all hell broke loose. After my bite, and a, lot, a lot of people ask me, okay, gee, are you not afraid of sharks? Are you more cautious? No, not at all. I still do the same things, and I wouldn't even say I'm much more closer to sharks. Eric lost most of his left calf muscle. The episode shows how a seemingly docile shark can quickly become stressed and then aggressive. Hordes of holidaymakers plus lots of small sharks equal many small bites. That pushes up the overall attack numbers. That makes fatality rates in the whole of the USA look very low. Deaths make up just 2% of attacks. Compare that to the global figure. Worldwide, 10% of all attacks are fatal. Hawaii also has lower death rates. That's remarkable, with so many swimmers and surfers, and the nature of its dominant shark, the tiger. Unlike white sharks, tiger sharks don't have warm blood, so they live in the tropics. Tigers are tanks, heavily built and blunt-headed. They reach a maximum length of about five meters. Their senses are tuned for the hunt listening to hear a turtle break the surface or watching for its shadow. Tiger sharks and humans collide around harbors and surf breaks, areas where tigers patrol. When a tiger shark hits a person, it's usually a surfer, because surfers are in the tiger's preferred habitat. They're also in a zone of a favorite prey item, sea turtles. The tiger packs a powerful bite to penetrate the shell of the sea turtle. It twists and turns, its sharp teeth cutting through shell and flesh like a power saw. Halloween morning, 2003, budding surf champ Bethany Hamilton discovered that some nightmares come true. Although they don't often see them, Hawaiian surfers ride with tiger sharks every day, so it's lucky that they seldom think of humans as food. Bethany Hamilton was surfing with the Blanchard family when she was attacked. We were all sitting, you know, at, in a group pretty much pretty close together, not more than probably 10 or 15 feet apart from each other. All of a sudden, she says, I got attacked by a shark. And then um, I thought it was like a joke at first. It took a while after we saw it to really understand that it happened but her arm was gone to about right there. We didn't even think about the shark. We were just like, 
making sure she was okay. She was just like praying and just talking to herself. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of blood. It wasn't as much as, as like in the like Jaws movie and stuff, but there was a lot. I didn't see how we were gonna get her to the beach in time before she bled to death. Being young and fit, Bethany's blood vessels contracted and reduced her blood loss. She made a remarkable recovery. After she got her stitches out, I think it was like a month later, she, all she wanted to do was go surfing again, and she did. I think it was about exactly a month after the attack, she was back out surfing again. I don't think I could be as good as Bethany is right now if I had my arm bit off. She is an inspiration and reminder to us all what a positive attitude can really do. I'm very proud to present this Teen Choice Courage Award to Bethany Hamilton. Now, Bethany's life has spun off in a very different direction. During the Bethany uh, Hamilton incident, um, a fisherman did go out and catch a large tiger shark uh, in fairly close proximity to the area. The jaw size seemed to match the bite marks on the, on the board. However, we don't really know if that was the animal involved. The situation portrayed in Jaws where sharks are actively hunting people, we know is just totally false. Unlike Jaws, tiger sharks almost always abandon their human victims after one bite. They're ocean wanderers, patrolling a large area in search of seasonal food like nesting turtles or fledgling albatrosses. Until that was understood, attacks triggered revenge hunting. Even government agencies participated, though the work sickened the biologists involved. We literally removed thousands of sharks, including hundreds of tiger sharks. That was considered the thing to do then, control the population. Uh, we now know that that's just biologically doesn't make sense at all. I don't think they should kill anymore, because I think they're cool. It doesn't happen very often. They say that more people die from coconuts landing on their heads than they do from shark attacks. <laughs> In the cold waters off the northern California coast, marine mammals are growing more and more numerous and are a rich food source for big white sharks. The biggest can exceed six meters and weigh as much as 2,300 kilos, heavier than two football teams. It has good eyesight and is one of the few sharks to peek above the surface of the water. They are perfectly equipped to hunt their favorite warm-blooded prey here, the California sea lion and the huge blubbery elephant seal. White sharks strike hard and unseen, often from below. Predatory bouts look like what they are, feeding events. The way you act when you want that snack is not the same as when you have this biological need to feed, when the body is screaming, fuel me, I need the nutrition. All Californian shark fatalities have been caused by great whites. Californian attack statistics match the world average. There have been two deaths here in a decade. One of them, 51-year-old Deborah Franzman. She was an avid ocean swimmer. Pam Ouellette swam with her just a few times. She will never forget how she heard of her friend's death. I had a message on my telephone. Was this Debbie? in the news, she said there was this woman that was killed at Avila that day in a shark attack. Well, and I said, oh, no, no, that's, that's not her. I decided out of curiosity to watch the news that night when her face just exploded on the screen. It was real shock. It was a real shock. A shark attack expert traveled to Avila to interview the witnesses. 
One of the witnesses on the pier observed Deborah in the water with the seals. And while looking directly at her, suddenly there was a splash of all of these bait fish exploding from the water, followed in a split second by the seals in a starburst effect shooting out away from the center where Deborah was located. And of course, within the blink of an eye, she was struck by the shark. The shark had almost bitten her in two, snapped her femur and severed her femoral artery, and, and she, um, she bled to death quite, quite quickly. We would swim out in the water. We would get, maybe pick our heads up and see some seals nearby, and we would swim away from them, keep a safe distance from them. So she would swim, as I said, several times a week. And she said, you know, if, if something were to happen to me out there, she said that would be the place for me to go. How does an expert study sharks at close range and still avoid attack from these sophisticated predators? I tend to try to apply white shark etiquette, what they would do with one another. And I've learned from my experience that if a white shark is coming at me and I see that its behavior has escalated to the point where it's ready to go at me, I go to it. I try to exert my dominance. The range that I can spread my arms. This is all my space. Anything beyond that belongs to them. I treat them like they would treat one another. In other words, once a shark gets here, I'm ready to engage it physically. Be that just pressing on it, pushing on it, striking at it. It all depends on the motivation. I've even gone so far as going displaying my weapons. Young and bulletproof, surfers have the most robust attitude of all to the risk from shark attack. Australia is shark death capital of the world. The fatality rate is double the world average. Most attacks are by great white sharks. The body was recovered from Left Handers Bay in Gracetown, one of the most popular surfing spots in the southwest. At 5 to 2 this afternoon, a man swam ashore to see. Another young surfer saw Brad Smith's horrific attack. He'd just done it, come straight up and gone attack. And then straight away from then, it just started doing its lunging, trying to close more of Brad into its jaws, sort of thing. He's fallen off his board, he's looked like, seen what's happening with his board broken and the shark coming into him, and he's gone like that and sort of punching it like that to try and backpedal and stop it. He had a few marks where the shark's been lunging onto him like this. Don't think he had anything from about there upwards. His leg there was actually been severed in half. It was only hanging on by like uh, just the skin. The bite across here where he's sort of been disemboweled. As soon as Brad like, was stopped moving, the shark disappeared straight away. And that's when the smaller shark started making a circle and coming towards me. That's when I thought, oh, far out, I better get this wave coming through. It is clear that the initial motive behind the shark was predatory. It strikes him very hard and it follows it up with repeated hits and then it breaks contact without feeding and leaves. Biologist Mark Marx uses all the raw data he can lay his hands on. The physical evidence left over doesn't lie. So now it's a part of forensically piecing it together. You can study wound pattern tooth impressions. Every attack leaves bite marks on equipment and flesh. These help Mark deduce the nature of the attack, the species of attacker, and its motives. It's not so far from what 
a crime scene investigator would do with a piece of evidence. <laughs> good to meet you, mate. Good to meet you, Mike. Well, good to see you on both feet. Right on. You know, you Mark is meeting a now. diver who's had both legs like deep in a shark's head. mouth. Yeah, it's snout on his chest. I'm sitting at 17 meters and I'm thinking, geez, that's a big shark. Oh, then all of a sudden he just spun around and straight at me. As he's coming up from the bottom, he gets closer and closer and closer and, the, and all of a sudden his mouth just opens and both my legs disappear inside. Then the big bite. Then at that stage I'm thinking, Christ, he's gonna break my legs, mm -hmm. break my legs. All the meantime, we're getting thrashed around like a giant uh, washing machine. Right. What happened next is I didn't even feel him leave my legs. I didn't even feel that. I'm just sort of shooting to the surface and I'm screaming at the boys to, to come and get me. For clarity, show me kind of where you are and let's use th this little shark replica and show me exactly how it came up from the bottom He's looking around down there and he's going, God, what's happening here? And all of a sudden, I'm, I'm sitting about here. Look, I'm okay. sitting about here. He spins around, he just comes straight at me like that. Both my legs end up in his mouth. Your legs are in its gut. You're reaching back to get the spear gun that incidentally probably saved your, your life or at least your legs. Show me like how far apart do you think the eyes were? Oh, be that, probably that far at least. This shark is gonna keep growing, growing in girth to where you've got a shark that you probably couldn't even have put your arms around its shoulders. This is upper jaw here. This, uh, this is, looks like possibly a lateral tooth. It's the longest one on this side. Okay, so that looks like maybe a single tooth running through, possibly. The preoperative photographs of Alan Oprah the teeth tell the tale. The shark came up directly underneath him, grabbing him as we see here. This is all we had to work with. We would say this was an investigatory type of bite. I know which injuries correspond with which teeth. For example, on our, our white shark here, these injuries come about from these two lower rows of the bottom teeth. The top injury to his left leg is more than likely the result of a lateral tooth from the top. There's still one more part of the puzzle to come, supplied by Alan's mate, Dave. I normally do a bit of fishing when the boys go diving, um, and I did hook up a big one, which broke my standstill trace. So Dave says that he had been using live bait and fishing on a stainless steel wire 200 pound trace. To break this line would have taken an enormous amount of force. Very unlikely there was a fish down there that day large enough to do it other than a white shark. The white shark could have cut the line. The fish then might have run for refuge under the reef, which they'll often do. I said to Albert, did you see a shark or something down there? Just jokingly, because something to break a stainless steel trace, you think it must have big teeth or something like that. Could there have been predatory motive underlying that brought the shark to the state that it's in? Absolutely. So down there was a hungry, excited shark in hunting mode. Sensing Alan above, it rushed to check him out with its razor teeth. Physical wounds may heal quickly, but mental trauma can go much deeper as Alistair Kerr found. So I was just on the surface waiting, and the, the boat was probably about 100 metres away, and uh, I signalled for them to come and pick me up. I looked down, and all I saw was this um, shark, and it must have been, you know, it was just like about as big as that. I could see its eye looking at me, and, and it came up the side of my leg, and it picked it up in the catch bag in its mouth, and had a couple of goes on, on my arm, and I remember holding on to it. It was heading straight towards me, and I tried to fend it off, and I remember it coming up, and it picked up the bag in its mouth. And it came round and put me on the arm. At this point, the bag, has it been pulled up? Are the teeth still attached? Or I it? would imagine, and looking at the bag, the bag was in his mouth, and that's why I've still got my arm. Okay, so we know that these teeth here, possibly one of these anterior or lateral tooth on the 
upper left hand side of the shark's jaw are responsible for this. The nature of it showing that we have an excision where tissue is removed tells me the tooth comes in and there's a little bit of movement, kind of like scooping or slicing out. You now have what you say is a second bite. Do you actually recall a bite, bite? I can remember a bite, bite. Okay. It's very, it's, it's very possible because often when white sharks are investigating something, they go. Out of a life experience, out of 10, you'd have to go to 11. Because, you know, as I said, not many people experience um, what I've been through. It took me three months to actually get back into the water. And when I was diving, you know, I'd get awfully fearful of, you know, keep looking around, you know, I'd, I'd get a sore neck, you know, looking around for sharks. And uh, they came across probably one and a half metre sand shark. And it was just a sand shark. But it was the shape of the shark and, uh, and how incredibly fast they could move in the water. And I, I just, um, yeah, I just couldn't handle it. And went to the surface and went onto the boat and just broke down and cried, you know, it was just, um, just so fearful. And it just brought all those feelings back. Then I decided that, hey, I really had to go and get professional help if I was going to get back in the water and be comfortable. Somebody's been attacked by a shark. Uh, they might have lost a bit of a limb. They might have been damaged. They might regard themselves as having been incompetent in the situation. I don't know. It could be any or all of those things. Whatever, it is a loss. So, yeah, I had uh, three visits to the psychologist. I relived the whole thing again. It was quite amazing. And, uh, yes, I, I can't really explain how it happened or why it happened, but um, it, it, it did work. There are few that can relate to the experience of having a shark bite them or coming in very aggressively. I know what that feeling is like. Should we be afraid of sharks? No. It's irrational for us to worry about the chances of encountering a shark that would bite us. We are not part of a shark's diet. That being said, you should certainly stay aware. You cannot go into any wild environment and be switched off. When we enter the water, when we enter the wild, we enter the food chain. Sometimes, very rarely, humans are treated as prey. Years of research have convinced Mark that sharks aren't mindless killers. They're mindful predators. White sharks represent the beauty of nature. I fear that we could be the cause of the demise of this just, this wonderful work of, of life. Perhaps surprisingly, many shark attack victims agree with Mark's view. What happened to me was just something out of the blue. You know, I just can't see the point in going out and catching a white shark. I think they should be protected. For some, the lure of the ocean remains so strong that they can't wait to get back into the water. Never had a bad thing about uh, underwater creatures. I mean, that's just my passion. I, I love diving and love being underwater. And as for the the attack, I mean, it's it's happened and. I still go back in the water. Um, I was back diving after four and a half weeks. Well, they say, let's just like riding a horse and get back to it and get back on. It's like diving, I suppose, and get bitten by a shark, go back in the water. A shark wiped out Chris Sullivan's surfing holiday, but not his enthusiasm. I think right now, if you said if the leg was better, here's a board, I'd probably, I'd probably get in. I mean, I'd get in, but I don't know how I'd feel while I was out there. Every day I relive it, but. I wouldn't say now, you know, it scares me or anything like that, and I know that it, it'll be fine, I can deal with it, and it, it'll fade. I'm sure it'll always be there with me, it'll fade. You know, I'm still going to carry on with my dreams. 
The survivors have gone way beyond most people's fear of monster sharks. They have been inside the predator's jaws and lived. And yet their message is not revenge, but respect for these beautiful killers. The truth is, we humans barely even figure in the waters that sharks rule.